Welcome to Studies with Stearman. Join us as we look deeper into the Bible. Strengthen your faith with us, even as we see the day approaching. And now, here's Gary. Well, last week we looked at the fig tree as Israel. Luke 21, 29, and he spake to them a parable. Behold, the fig tree and all the trees. Now, the fig tree is Israel. All the trees are the other nations. And we commented last week that at the time Israel was born, May 14, 1948, there were about 99 nations in the world. Today, there are about 195. And the prophecy of Luke, I think, speaks to that. He said, when you see the fig tree and all the trees, when they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. Well, summer is code language in the Bible. When you see latter rain or summer in the Bible, or when you see latter rain and summer mentioned together, you know you're talking about the time of harvest. And metaphorically, the time of harvest is the time of the latter days. And so Luke says, quoting Jesus, when they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So, likewise, when you see all these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. When he says the kingdom of God, he is not talking about the church at all. He's talking about Israel. When you see the term gospel of the kingdom being preached, you're not talking about the church. You're talking about the kingdom, which is the millennial reign of Christ on earth. So when Jesus says, you know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand, that is another way of saying that the structure of spiritual effort on earth is about to be shifted away from the church toward the kingdom. I believe we're living in those transitional days right now. And the reason wickedness has come to such a blatant state worldwide is that the great change is about to take place. And I don't know whether you've noticed it or not, but every day I surf the internet, mostly looking at the news of Israel, but also other news. And I also read several newspapers, print papers, and I'm scanning all those papers to see what's going on in terms of the stage being set for the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And when I do that, I'm seeing something interesting. In addition to Mideast news, I'm seeing an increasing coarsening of the dialogue in the world. Within a matter of months, I've seen a great change in the way people are talking to each other. The dialogue is no longer as civilized as it was. Language is rougher. Metaphors are rougher. People are getting angry. We're seeing all the signs of the tattering of civilization and of civil discourse, which tells me what time it is. And we know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. And then Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And by the way, that takes us to the end of the book of Revelation. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Heaven and earth must pass away. The present heavens and the present earth, you know, the Hubble telescope field of galaxies that you see in National Geographic magazine, all of the specials that you see on TV concerning nature and water and mountains and birds and evolution, all of that stuff is going to pass away because it's corrupted. Everything that you see around you is corrupted, including the back of your own hand. And it's got to pass away. It's got to be made new again. That's what he's talking about here. The whole process of renewal. The blossoming of the fig tree. Now last week we talked about the fig tree as a type of Israel. We talked about the fact that the fig tree is unique in that its leaves do not come out until after its fruit has been formed. The leaves are typical of religion. The fruit is typical of the Spirit of God. Don't ever confuse religion with the Spirit of God. It's two different things. Religion is pipe organs and candles and velvet runners and all those wonderful things, costumes, etc. But the fruit of the Spirit takes place outside of the realm of religion. And so the fig tree has the leaves 
You remember Jesus cursed that fig tree because it sprouted all those beautiful leaves but had no fruit. It had no fruit of the Spirit. And so that was Israel in the state that he found it when he came the first time. You remember how he chose Nathaniel, who was sitting under a fig tree. And Nathaniel is a type of Israel. Nathaniel in the shade of a fig tree being chosen by Jesus is a foreshadowing of what Jesus is going to do moving on into the time of Jacob's trouble as he chooses the 144,000. Even Nathaniel's name, Nathaniel, a gift of God. He was a gift of God to Jesus. By the way, did you know that you yourself are a gift of God to Jesus? That's what it says in Scripture. The Father giveth whom he will unto the Son. So you have been given as a gift by the Father unto the Son. You are, in a sense, are a Nathaniel. Then we looked at Adam and Eve and the fig leaf, which set the whole trend. The fig leaf is a wonderful, colorful, heavy-duty leaf, and apparently it's thick enough and heavy enough that it can be stitched together to make a temporary covering. And that's exactly what religion is. It's a temporary covering. Well, Jesus cursed that fig tree, and then he went his way. But he's going to bring back the figs into Israel. And we looked at Jeremiah 24, which is a prophecy of the figs being brought back into the Holy Land and being planted. And he says, For I will set my eyes upon them for good. I will bring them back again to this land. I will build them and not pull them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. And I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. And the evil figs which cannot be eaten... They are so evil. Surely, thus saith the Lord. So will I give Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and his princes, and the residue of Jerusalem that remain in this land, and all them that dwell in the land of Egypt. The rest of those bad figs are going to be cast away. And then we concluded last week in Revelation 6.13, where you have the beginning of the tribulation. And the fig tree is used there as a symbol as well. Revelation 6.13, And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And it's not going to be good for Israel during the tribulation, but Israel will be brought through the tribulation. Last week we mentioned the fact that we have been grafted into the tree of Israel, but it's not a fig tree. It's an olive tree. We've been grafted in as a wild olive branch into the olive tree of Israel, which is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The olive is the tree that produces the oil for the lamps of God. And when we get to Revelation, of course, we see the menorah of God and Jesus standing in the middle of that menorah. The oil that illuminates those lamps comes from the olive tree into which we have been grafted. Let's talk about another tree. Go back to Zechariah. Now, I promise you we're going to get to Revelation today. We're working our way there. Zechariah. In 520 B.C., the Jews who had been displaced to Babylon returned. And they were in the process of building the temple. Zechariah, written in 520 B.C., is talking about the return from Babylon to Israel. And in that return, you have an opening metaphor in Zechariah. Zechariah 1.7, And upon the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month, which is the month of Shavat, the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo the prophet, saying, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse, and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, that is, down the valley. And behind him there were red horses, sorrel horses, and white horses. And I, I said, Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show you what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they 
whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro among the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. This is the setting for the first return from the captivity. And the horses among the myrtle trees here are symbolic of God moving by his spirit. Okay? So we talked about the fig and the olive, but we haven't talked about the myrtle tree yet. Anybody know what the myrtle tree symbolizes? It is a very powerful symbol in the Bible. It is one of the four species. The four species are four different kinds of plants that have symbolic significance during the Jewish holiday of Sukkot, or tabernacles. In Leviticus 23.40, which comes in the midst of a discussion of Sukkot, the Torah says, that is the books of Moses, on the first day you shall take the product of the Hadar trees, the myrtle trees, branches of the palm trees, the boughs of the leafy trees, and the willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Well, that is Sukkot. And people take the four species, the citron, the palm branch, the myrtle twigs, and the willow. We haven't talked about the willow either, but we're going to talk about the myrtle tree. The myrtle, the hadassah, is a tree that represents Israel in the kingdom. That is to say, it is a beautiful, scented evergreen, has a nice smell to it, kind of like a Christmas tree, you know, a good Christmas tree smell. And it has pinkish purple blossoms on it. So in full bloom, the myrtle branch is beautiful to look at. It smells good. And it is commanded at Sukkot to wave the myrtle branch with the other three species. Each of the species is a symbol of Israel in the kingdom. But the myrtle tree is kind of special because it's a symbol of Israel in a state of solidarity and productivity in the kingdom. So you have these horses among the myrtles in Zechariah that are a symbol of what God is doing when he brings people back from Babylon. Now, let's move on down in Zechariah 1, 18 through uh, 21 and look again. And believe me, I'm going someplace with this. Now, why is Gary reading about myrtle trees this morning? Well, there's a good reason for this. Then I lifted up my eyes. When a prophet lifts up his eyes, he's about to see a vision. And I saw, and behold, four horns. So, four horns. What is that? Does that make your little antenna stand up and tingle a little bit? The number four. What is that? The number four is the number of the kingdom. Whenever you see four mentioned in a prophecy, you're almost always talking about the kingdom of God. And so, so I lifted up my eyes, I saw four horns. Now, a horn in the Bible is a unit of power or a directorate, or it can be a nation, a Gentile nation, usually. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, What are these? And he answered and said, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. So these, then, would be Gentile powers. And you remember when Daniel talked about horns as power, and Daniel talked about four kingdoms that would act against Israel? Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. The kingdom is sort of a battle of the fours, north, south, east, and west. The kingdom of God, the surface of the earth, that is what is in contention. And that battle is raging even today. There's a fight to see who gets to control Mount Zion. And right now the Arab Waf is up there, and it thinks it's going to be up there for all the rest of time. What a joke. Because we've read the book. But there's a battle among the horns. He said, I lift up my eyes and behold four horns. And I said to the angel, talk with me. What are these? And he answered, these are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And the Lord showed me four carpenters. And these carpenters in Hebrew are called harashim. Carpenter is probably not a very good word. Harash in Hebrew is a craftsman. 
could be an artist, could be a carpenter, could be a stonemason, could be somebody who paints frescoes, someone who is capable of doing fine art on some level or other, building, engineering, just think of somebody who's capable of making beautiful things. And he says, the Lord showed me these four craftsmen, and then said I, what come these to do? And he spake, saying, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head. But these, these, that is the craftsmen, are coming to terrify them, to scare them away, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. And so we read this little bit of Zechariah the prophet, you're really reading about what actually came to pass in 520 B.C. as they were already five months into the building of the temple. In other words, when Zechariah got this prophecy, the second temple was five months into the building, and they were having a terrible time building it. They were beset by enemies and by discouragement and so forth and so on, and so God sends Zechariah a vision to encourage the people. This is part of that vision, the four horns and the four craftsmen. But the four horns, the four craftsmen, and the horses among the myrtle trees allow us to see how God thinks about Israel. Because right now, believe me, there are horses among the myrtle trees over there in Israel. Absolutely believe it. There are angels over there riding their horses. There are myrtle trees. And things are getting ready to happen in Jerusalem today, just as they happened in 520 B.C. We're reading about these horses, red horses, sorrel horses, white horses. These are angels that are moving, and they are doing what the Lord bids them to do, which takes us to Revelation chapter 6. Ordinarily, when you read the book of Revelation, you start in chapter 1 and go to chapter 2 and chapter 3 and 4 and so forth. We're going to start in chapter 6 because I wanted you to see this in the context of Zechariah the prophet. Horses. What are horses? Well, horses are the ones, as the angel told Zechariah, horses are the ones that are riding to and fro through the earth. And they are the ones who, in Zechariah's day, stand among the myrtle trees. Well, a horse standing next to a myrtle tree is God's way of saying, this is a power of God, an angelic power of God that is moving toward the establishment of the kingdom, the myrtle tree, which is a symbol of the kingdom. By the way, you remember Palm Sunday when Jesus rode in, you know, and the people waved palm branches? The reason they waved the palm branches was because they were saying, in effect, Tabernacles is come already. The king is here, and we're not going to wait until Tabernacles to wave the four species. We're going to wave them right now, even though it was early in the year, in the month Nisan, rather than late in the year at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. So they were aware of this kind of symbolism. Chapter 6 You have horses riding. The horses are the powers that are raised by God toward Israel. In other words, God is doing something about Israel. And the first horse is in Revelation 6, 1. I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. That beast, of course, is a cherub at the throne of God, one of the administrators at the throne of God, responsible for the affairs of the kingdom. And one of the four beasts said to John, take a look at this, because there's this white horse riding forth. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. That white horse and his rider we now, of course, sort of universally interpret as the Antichrist riding forth conquering. He has a bow. No arrows are mentioned. A lot of people have said that this bow 
which he's holding as he sits upon the white horse, is an instrument of war, but since no arrows are mentioned, he's coming forth sort of to make peace. Well, if he's the Antichrist, it would be a false peace. But there's another way to interpret that bow. Do you suppose that could be a rainbow? What is a rainbow the symbol of? Unification of all peoples. When you see a rainbow, maybe a bumper sticker with a rainbow on it, or maybe a rainbow coalition flag, maybe a flag that has the different colors of the rainbow on it and so forth. What are you looking at? I think everybody's been sensitized to the rainbow these days, have they not? What is it? The rainbow is the unification of all peoples, no matter how alienated they may be from the mainstream of society. It is the universal symbol of uniting under a global effort to make the world a better place. The rainbow. Really? You know about it. I don't have to tell you about the rainbow, do I? I can say a lot about the rainbow, but I think everybody understands. The rainbow has become a symbol of the outcast, the disparate, the, the one who has not been welcomed into society prior to this time is now welcome. Come on in. We are going to be good neighbors. The rainbow. It's very possible that this interpretation of the bow held by the man on the white horse is the rainbow. And I have seen this image in my mind of a man on a white horse with maybe a rainbow over his head like this, riding along and saying, Welcome all ye people. No one will be outcast. Diversity. Diversity, right? The rainbow. So think about that as a possible interpretation of the bow. But it's a white horse. And the one riding on a white horse, of course, is the hero. Who always rides a white horse? King Arthur. Whoever. It's Sir Lancelot. It is the guy. It's the big guy. He's the one coming in to save the day. And in this case, he would be a false witness of Christ. Because later on in the book, we see the true rider on the white horse, Revelation 19, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. So here we have the Antichrist. He's going forth conquering to conquer. Why does the Antichrist do this? If somebody asks you the question, why does there have to be an Antichrist at all, what would you answer them? The Antichrist must be sent to Israel. That's according to Daniel. That's who the Antichrist goes to. Book of Daniel. He is the coming prince. He signs the covenant with the people. He essentially raises Israel up to a pinnacle of power just prior to the tribulation. They think our man is here at last, and so he's a false messiah. This must happen. Why must it happen? Because the tribulation is coming. The tribulation, called the time of Jacob's trouble, is essentially prophesied and brought forth by the Lord as a purification for Israel. It wipes out wickedness in Israel. It brings about worldwide revival through the 144,000. And finally, it breaks the willful, prideful attitude of the Jews. So that tribulation is aimed right smack at Israel. And beginning with this man on the white horse, who is the coming prince, who rides in as Israel's champion, and he's carrying a bow. Now, Maybe it's a bow of war. I tend to think that it's a bow of peace. The second horse comes in, and I kind of think of these horses as riding together and abreast. But remember, as seen in Zechariah, horses are powers raised by the Lord for a specific purpose as the horse is riding through the myrtle trees. When he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast, that is the cherub, and say, come and see. Take a look at this, John. And there went out another horse that was red. Power was given to him that sat thereon, take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. That there was given unto him a great sword. Armies are red. There's the red army of Russia. 
there is the Red Army of Red China. Red, red, red. Red is the color of war. Red is the universal symbol of war. Blood. Here come the redcoats, etc. Whatever you want to say, it's the universal symbol of war. So you have a man on a white horse with a bow bringing a kind of a false peace followed by war. Peace brings war. Stop think about that. Is that not what's happening in the world today? Everybody is saying, peace, 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 peace. If we just make that last peace treaty, everything's going to be just fine. And then will come the red horse of war. Power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. So we have two horses. Remember the horse. The horse is a power ordained of God. I think these horses, by extension, are horses among the myrtle trees because what they're doing ultimately through the seven years of the tribulation is bringing in the kingdom. Kingdom is symbolized by the myrtle tree. Third seal, verse 5, when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and behold, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. Balancing scales by which things are measured out. This horse speaks of scarcity, which always follows war. I heard the voice in the midst of the four beasts say a measure of wheat for a denarius, which is a day's wage. In other words, you have just enough to feed yourself on a day's wage and nothing more. This is called subsistence living. Measure of wheat for a denarius, three measures of barley for a denarius. See that thou hurt not the oil and the wine. You don't have much, and what you do have does not include much in the way of excess. Oil and wine, oil being always in the Bible the symbol of plenty, either spiritually or physically. If you've got oil, you're thought to be rich. Wine, you are thought to be rich. And when he had opened the fourth seal, verse 7, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. So you have the white horse, the red horse of war, the black horse of all of those things that follow war. Every place you have a war, you have famine, you have sickness, you have scarcity, you have black markets, you have commodities being essentially begged, borrowed, and stolen. It happens every time there's a war. The fourth seal is the pale horse, which is a horse called Clory. When he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse. Clory is the Greek word, C-H-L-O-R-E, from which we get our English word chlorine. And chlorine, if you've ever seen it in a beaker, is pale green in color. It is the essence of poison gas. Boy, if you see a beaker full of chlorine gas, it's heavier than air and it settles to the bottom of the beaker. And in chemistry class, we used to play with chlorine a little bit. <laughs> Not much. Don't take a breath of it, by the way. But it is this pale, sickly green color. And what is the color of sickly green? What do you see when you watch a TV program? And you see a, a bunch of people coming into an old warehouse that's dimly lit, and it has just the color of the place is green, and the walls are kind of wet, and the water's dripping, and the water's dripping off pipes. And, and the color of the whole place is this pale green color. Scully and Mulder are basically in there looking for an alien, or it's an evil laboratory of some kind where they're making poison. It's always pale green. Have you ever noticed that in the movies? Pale green is the color of pestilence. It's the color of poison gas. It's the color of germ warfare. It is the color of illness, sickness. That's what you have in this fourth horse. I looked and behold a pale horse. By the way, it's also the color of nuclear death. For some reason, there's this association of pale green with nuclear radiation. The name of him that sat on him was death, and hell followed him, that his Hades followed him. Boy, you talk about an image. you got an image here. You have a pale green horse with this gaunt figure sitting on him, and behind him was hell. 
and people are dying and going to hell by the thousands. Power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, with the beasts of the earth. This is only the beginning because the tribulation has not come yet. And you say, well, how do you know? Well, because I read about the opening of the fifth seal right after the fourth horse. Verse 9, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice. These are the righteous dead under the altar of God crying out, for justification, crying out for revenge, crying out for the right thing to be done at last. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? In other words, the judgment and the vengeance has not taken place yet. And the people who have died in the wars that are mentioned here are watching this whole thing from a heavenly vantage point, and they notice that in spite of the horsemen of the apocalypse, justice still isn't being done, and vengeance still is not being taken. That means it cannot be the day of the Lord, because the name of the day of the Lord is justice and vengeance. So here in verse 10, when they say, How long, O Lord, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood? That means that the tribulation period has not started yet. The Lord has not begun. Well, then you say, well, what are these six seals for? The six seals are preparation. They are not judgment. Because the judgment takes place when the trumpets are sounded and the vials are poured out. The seals are simply preparation. Verse 11, and white robes were given unto every one of them. So these are the righteous saints who have been killed in one way or another during this war, this famine and pestilence. And remember what Jesus told the disciples? He said, you're going to see a lot of this stuff happening, but the end is not yet. That's what Jesus said. He said, you shall hear of wars, rumors of wars, see that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. All these things being famines, pestilences, earthquakes, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, but the end is not yet. So there is going to be a huge global war, and out of that war is going to come the tribulation period. And in fact, I believe we can interpret Revelation so that it becomes very clear that the Antichrist steps up in this chaotic situation and comes to power saying, I can bring some sense out of all of this nonsense that's happened. The world's going to be in a shambles. And he's going to step forward and be received. Verse 11 of Revelation 6, And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So not all the people have been killed yet. So the Lord has said, a lot of my saints are going to have to die. And your first reaction, well, please, Lord, don't let it be me. It might be. It might be. If the Lord requires your death as a saint, praise the Lord. Which, by the way, I do not say jokingly. I mean, that makes me kind of shake a little bit to say that, but other saints have died for the witness of the Lord. Now, five seals have been opened. The sixth seal changes things. And when he had opened the sixth seal, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Now, you remember what Joel says, Joel the prophet? In Joel 2.10, Joel says, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. Joel 2.10. And the Lord shall utter His voice before His army, for His camp is very great. 
For he is strong and executeth his word, for the day of the Lord is very great and terrible. Who can abide it? And then over in Joel 2.31, A sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Before the tribulation period. So you flip over here to Revelation 6.12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And this is still before the tribulation. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she's shaken of a mighty wind. That refers to Israel and the figs shaken to the ground. It's not going to be an easy thing for Israel. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. That's called plate tectonics, by the way. Earthquake, plates skidding hither, thither, and yon, islands sinking, other islands being raised up, things falling out of the sky, the sun being darkened. Wow! I mean, if you were alive during that time, fear, the word fear would not even come close to describing your condition. You'd be absolutely petrified. Fifteen, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men, every bondman, every free man, hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of His wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And so now we're coming to the tribulation period, right now. At this point, the sixth seal then sets the final positional pieces in place. And by the way, notice that everybody's hiding in the ground. I've got an item here from Bloomberg News, dated May 12, 2011. And the headline is Apocalypse Angst. The lead line of the story is Terrorism can be good for bunker builders. And Apocalypse can be even better for business. Daniela Andreev started building panic rooms three years ago when fears of terrorist tactics and commercial disputes turning violent created a demand in Russia. Now he's selling survival bunkers for as much as $400,000 each to capitalize on angst over theories that the world will end next year. He said, I myself am not a believer in doomsday scenarios, but when you start hearing clients talking about the end of the world, it gets you to thinking. This story goes on, it's too long to read, but essentially it turns out that all over, not just Russia, but into China, and in the Middle East, bunkers are being built. Here's a paragraph. Altai, the mountainous southern Siberian region that borders China, Mongolia, and Kazakhstan, is of particular interest because it's believed to be floodproof, Andreev said. So people are flocking to Altai, and they are building underground bunkers. Here's a number for $350,000. It's an 80-square-meter underground bunker in Altai. So you can contact this Danila Andreev if you want to buy one of these underground bunkers. They quote him as saying, you know, they're all saying the same thing. Next year there will be a polar shift or something like that, and most of Russia will be flooded except for Altai and a few other regions. And bunker building is going very well. He says, I can't keep up the pace. Well, I read that in Bloomberg News, and then I read Revelation. Kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men, every bondman, every freeman, hid themselves in the dens and the rocks and the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. So if you're a Russian with a $400,000 bunker, you're still going to be scared. And furthermore, they seem to recognize at the end that it's God doing it. Hide us, they say, from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. Well, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, Lord Jesus, come soon. I don't mind seeing his face at all. I want to see his face. They're all saying, hide us from his face and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand it? Speaking of Russia, 
I have one final note, and of course that takes us right back to you know where, Ezekiel 38. 38, 17, Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants the prophets of Israel? He's talking to Gog. Who is Gog? Gog is Russia. What are the Russians doing? The Russians are building bunkers because they're thinking the end of the world is coming soon. Why? We could all be flooded out. Why? We could be killed in earthquakes. Why? Who knows? The sun might go out. Why? There could be a supernova. Why? On and on. And on. People are scared right now. I tell you, people are afraid worldwide. And I am not. I want you to know at all. I'm looking in a way that I have never looked before for the coming of the Lord. 38.17, Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he, speaking to Russia, of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them, and it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come up against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and the fire of my wrath, same statement of facts that we have just read about in Revelation chapter 6. In my fury and in my wrath, for in my jealousy in the fire of my wrath have I spoken surely in that day, there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. So that exactly describes what we have just read in Revelation chapter 6. Now we know for a fact that the four horsemen of the apocalypse are a simultaneous event simultaneous with and the same as, or roughly the same as, the attack by Gog, the northern invasion of Israel. As I look at the Middle East today, I notice that Russia is taking more and more of an interest in what's going on there. Vladimir Putin and his pals are plowing millions of rubles into transportation facilities, storage facilities, Weapons depots, deep water seaports, Latakia in Syria, for example. The Russians are coming. To use an old worn out phrase, the Russians are coming once again, even as the Bible said they would. That's our opening foray into the book of Revelation. We'll go from there next week. What can I say except keep looking up? <laughs> 